Welcome to Chats with the Chief. I'm John Jensen, Chief of Staff at the Veterans Health Administration, and this is the podcast where we make small talk about the largest integrated health care system in the country. This week, I'm joined by Dr. Cameron Matthews, Assistant Undersecretary for Health for Clinical Services. We'll talk about the process of transitioning to new roles and prioritizing diversity and inclusion in medicine. Enjoy the show. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for taking the time to be with us today. I am so excited that you're here, so very excited to have you here. So let's get started. Yeah. And the first thing I wanted to kind of share with the audience is your amazing background. So maybe you can talk about kind of where you come from and how in the world you got a Juris Doctorate after getting <laughs> your medical degree. <laughs> Thank you, John. Um, yeah, uh, it's it's been a fun uh, road to the VA. I'll say it like that. Um, I'm originally from Philly. I am a diehard Eagles fan that will never uh, change and um, ended up going to medical school because my father is a physician as well. Um, a huge role model for me. He was the first uh, person in our family to go to college. Wow. So for him to have really achieved that, I just always looked up to him and still do to this day. Um, he's a family physician like I am. So very, very proud about that, that background. Um, and I did most of my career in Chicago. Before the VA, I had multiple different roles um, at Cook County Jail. I was a correctional physician wow. um, with a couple of community health centers, also called FQHCs, um, where I was chief medical officer and uh, managed care director in, in different roles. Um, and then decided to move back east again to be closer to my parents, to closer to Philly, um, and happened upon uh, a, the opportunity in the Office of Community Care, and that's how I wound up at, at VA. It's been great. Um, the law degree that was a that was a different route. That, admittedly, my my dad. I'll never forget the conversation. My dad said, "So my daughter's gonna be a lawyer," because <laughs> <laughs> I was in medical school at the time. Oh my god! And so my third year of medical school for me. Um, it was about realizing that every patient that I saw um, had issues that we couldn't solve right. in the exam room or in the operating room, and that there were larger policy concerns and ways I needed to advocate for my patients beyond just what my medicine training could provide. So I went to law school, and I loved every second of it, with the exception of my contracts class, to, funny enough to then wind up in community right. care, where but <laughs> where I read contracts all the time. But um, loved everything. I took family law, immigration law, a lot of constitutional law, and was really focused on just what is this environment, what is this space called the United States, called community that we function in, and that my patients are receiving right. services in. And so. Um, it's made me a better physician. I'll say it like that. It's made me um, more analytical. Um, I, I'm not, <laughs> a lot of my physician friends are always upset at lawyers and upset at the loopholes and everything. And I love every bit of it, actually. It, I always say I'm speaking both languages, yeah. so. You, you get to make doctor and lawyer jokes. Right? I do. You get to participate. I do. I get to, I get to, I get to, exactly. I make fun of lawyers more, admittedly, <laughs> right. but um, yes. <laughs> right. That is amazing. Yeah. That's amazing. Well, and you did it. You were going to medical school when you began your work in law school. Yeah, I took a leave of absence amazing. my third year of medical school to go to law school. Wow. Yeah. Well, that is amazing. And, I, and you did it, obviously, for the right reasons to really learn it. But the great other thing you mentioned is that you do learn a di, di, ditalic way of looking at things. Mm -hmm. that you, di, you know, When you look at things as a family physician, that you also can look at it in that same kind of mindset, exactly. I'm sure. That's, I'm sure it would really be helpful. But it's, it's amazing. And your parents are still in Philly? Yeah, they're still there in yeah. the house I grew up in. Yeah. in. Um, we clearly won't be uh, together for Thanksgiving. Uh, yeah, As you know, we're, we're appropriately physical distancing um, but I see them often it's it's great when I was in Chicago maybe yeah. got home a couple times a year right just because of my schedule now uh, it's a quick drive yes so. very before we even get started because we always ask them same questions to all of our guests just yeah. to keep everybody I really wanted to mention because this morning I was walking into work and there's a mural if anybody doesn't oh, know wow. there's a mural <laughs> downstairs yes. at the um, at the entrance of the metro exit here yep. at our building at 810 Vermont yep. Avenue and your husband was one of the artists that helped do that not the artist but the the producer okay. I guess um, it, he uh, is an arts manager and runs a nonprofit that he founded right after college and part of uh, that is uh, working within communities, of course, this being Washington, D.C., and looking at public art and how we can use public space to really express and to empower 
Um, so the McPherson Square wall, that round wall there, he partnered with, actually with the VA, um, with the mayor's office, with the downtown bid, they're called, business improvement district, um, over about two years. You can imagine the loops yeah, yeah. and Here conversations DC, yeah. he had yeah. to have between all of those three entities. Um, and then found the artist, and it is just a depiction of veterans from different eras, yep. of, of different age, different race, and it's beautiful. It, it is. I'll tell beautiful. you that the one uh, caption or one person, I think, in that video or in that mural that catches me every single time is yeah. the Buffalo Soldier. Yes. At the very left of it, I believe yeah. it is, it catches my eye every yeah. single time. Even just walking down the street, it catches yeah, my eye. So it's a pretty cool deal. He's my favorite as well because I actually know him. Uh, is that right? He's a friend of my husband's. Yeah. So we use different models and everything That's for the face of facial characteristics so that they actually had some definition. Yeah. That's fantastic. Yeah, so if so you're ever in D.C., exactly. make sure you get to the McPherson Square uh, Metro exit, which is right below our building. Exactly. Um, you can see that mural. It's fantastic. It's yeah. so beautiful. It's wonderful. Yeah. It's wonderful. His organization, I have to highlight it, it's called Words, Beats, and Life. I love promoting it. Oh, they that's do, nice. They, they do murals, but then actually they're founded in um, doing classes and, and, again, community empowerment for youth across D.C. So they focus on all hip-hop arts. So oh, murals, okay. graffiti, breakdancing, DJing. It's yeah. amazing. It's and great there, to go home and think about that. And there's <laughs> quite a big, I must say, movement. There's quite a lot of uh, murals in the yes. city in D.C. Oh, exactly. of you know, telling different stories about things exactly. through history. Exactly. So He's got some major ones around yeah, the city. I, cool. We love going around. That's he actually cool. does a bike tour where he shows the really? wall and everything. Yeah. I need to hop on that bike tour. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's get started. Yeah. So we asked three kind of like quick fire questions, yes. really just to give some background thoughts as well as I always seem to get something out of like a saying or a book that somebody's reading. So okay. the first question is, is there a book or a movie a show or something that you've been reading or watching that yeah. really is kind of standing out that you wouldn't want to share? So the one that jumps out immediately, and it's it's so not something that I usually watch, uh, it, it just finished the season called Lovecraft Country on HBO. Have you heard of it? I have not heard it's of that. It's this amazing horror TV show, which is, I do not do horror <laughs> whatsoever, um, but set in basically Jim Crow US. Mm -hmm. um, so it goes between Chicago, Massachusetts, and then a little bit more south, and it's this beautiful horror movie. I mean, there's monsters, there's oh magic, gosh. there's this stuff that I just don't watch. Um, but set in the civil rights era where, you know, unfortunately, um, with all of the main characters being black, they actually are faced with a lot of racism. So it juxtaposed, right. which wow. is worse, the racism or the monsters. Oh, it, wow. It's, it's a fascinating show. I loved every minute of it. That, that is interesting to be able to look at both of yeah. which one's worse which one's kind worse. of thing. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. I had not yeah. heard of that. Yeah, they, and one of the scenes is actually um, after Emmett Till's death, his funeral, and what happens to the characters there and just what they go through. Wow. And Yeah, it's, it's beautifully done. It's hard to watch because of the issues that it raises. Yeah. Um, and then the horror, I was like ducking behind. I was like, what is this show? <laughs> like, it's making me scared and angry and sad right. and happy. Yeah. So, yeah, love well, craft Well, I country. think part of it is, I think, the, the race part yeah. needs to be the, the t difficult conversation. Hearing right. hard things, I guess, helps help us to move forward. But having a monster doing yeah. things probably right. isn't exactly. helpful to me. But. No, no. I, you know, I, I think um, in, in the show, you know, the costumes, the, they, they even the director, I started reading about it and listening to other podcasts about it. The director even purposefully shot some of the shots to be... Um, these historical photographs from the time oh, and wow. everything, like bringing it to yeah. life on the camera. It, it was just that's so well fantastic. Done. Yeah. Wow. It, just amazing the amount of imagination that the, people that's have. That's exactly what it is. Really, it was truly. so imaginative. Speaking of that, and we already covered kind of the, one of the things I think is really interesting is that not only where you came from to get to go into family medicine, but also to get your Juris Doctorate as well. But is there something that really interesting or unique that you'd want to share with people about you that uh, we'd all want to know? Um, so aside from my career, I'll, I'll be personal. Um, one of the things I love to do, I actually started, um, oh my goodness, it's been some years now, but I consider myself 
a runner, but I hate using that title because I, I'm, I'm really, I've been slacking a little bit. It puts bit pressure lately. on you. <laughs> it puts pressure, and, and, and others will be like, no, she's not. <laughs> but I've run uh, 15 half marathons. I have the medals Fantastic. up in my office, sometimes on Zoom. You can see the medals behind me. Um, and uh, I love it. It's, yeah. uh, it's the one exercise form that I've stuck with over time. I mean, I remember doing Zumba back in the day and all these different fad workouts right. and everything. Running is the only one that's that's really yeah. stuck. I don't wear music. I just go. It it clears wow. my mind. It's, yes. it's it's self care to yeah. an unbelievable degree. So that's I love fantastic. It. I was not aware of that actually. <laughs> I haven't been by your office lately. So um, that's fantastic. And it yeah. is something that you can just go and do. And I don't it have doesn't to make a class. Exactly. I don't have to worry about equipment. Right. I mean, I do shoes. <laughs> go a little crazy about the shoes because yeah. number one sports injury is yeah. actually due to your shoes when you're running. Yeah, so I, you yeah. have to find the right shoes. And, and you have to continue to replace them too. That's and, one yes. thing I learned over I the years. I track the miles and I yep. replace them every the to 250 it. to 300 miles. Yeah. Well, yeah. that's cool. Um, so what lesson or piece of advice have you ever gotten that sticks with you that you maybe even you share with other people? Oh, definitely. So I, I value and actually provide a lot of mentoring. Um, and so one of my mentors actually really clued me into the fact that I should have mentors from all walks of life, from all fields, from all ages, even um, mentors that are my direct colleagues. Uh, mentoring in and of itself is yep. just a way for you to learn about yourself, for you to really sculpt your own path. I've taken a very different path and so it's been uh, due to the fact that I've had unbelievable conversations and teachings and um, just advice from mentors throughout my career. Um, it helped me even figure out to come to the VA, one of my mentors I, I consider. He helped me walk through a lot of issues because I, I just you know, didn't know what direction I was going when I was moving from Chicago to, to, to the East Coast right. again. Um, so biggest piece of advice is is definitely no matter of what you're seeking out even if it's personal family life um, have a mentor to help you um, walk through the issues um, but don't look at mentors as someone who's going to tell you what to do you right. need to figure it out yourself the yeah. mentor is just the one to help uh, along the way yeah I think my best mentors have been those have been more coaches where yes. you know but what do you think you exactly. should do here's my thoughts or ideas but you have to kind of work that out because kind of you're the one that has to do it exactly yeah. and and you shouldn't really at least I personally have never wanted to take anyone else's path so I'm right. not <laughs> looking for you to tell me <laughs> right. what you did so that I can yeah. repeat it it's just yeah. so I can learn from yeah. it help help me pull out the things I need to exactly. see exactly well, thinking about, speaking about successes, um, so you were recently elected to the National Academy of Medicine. Yes. So, wow, congratulations. <laughs> Thank That's you. a big deal. I mean, that is a huge deal for not only those in medicine, but it's a huge deal for us in VHA. So congratulations. Thank so, you. Tell us a little bit about that. Thank you. So I, um, I'm still in shock uh, about <laughs> this. Um, I was fortunate enough to be selected as the American Board of Family Medicine National Academy of Medicine fellow a couple of years ago. So that I think put me on the radar, yeah, on uh, you know, at least with the academies. Um, and uh, it's, it's, it's really an honor to be part of a group uh, whose sole purpose is the advancement of well being and healthcare for, for our nation. And, and it's, it's multidisciplinary, but at the same time, typically not as strong in the primary care area, definitely not as strong in family medicine. So to be a part of that and to add to that conversation, I'm, I'm just truly honored. Well, well, we're, we're just uh, so happy and proud of you that you've done it. And uh, if you're not, if the people in the audience aren't following you on LinkedIn, I think you have a great LinkedIn page <laughs> oh, too, by the way. I, I, I try, to, <laughs> no, I try it, to be it really a little does. risky with it and share some information. But you, you wind up doing what you talked about earlier about mentoring, and I just mm -hmm. pick up little tidbits of things that you post out there just so you know. I'm okay. not stalking Good. Anything, No, please, that's the whole point. Yeah, no, that's right. That's exactly <laughs> that's right. Point. So you uh, had come to the VA originally in the Office of Community Care. Yes. And that, I don't know if people don't know, but that is a large organization. It is. Very large, and obviously it encompasses everything that we do in uh, purchase care throughout our communities. Um, and now you stepped into our chief medical officer role, the yes. assistant undersecretary for health for clinical operations. Clinical services. Clinical services. Yes. You recently stepped into that role. Wow. Yes. Wow. <laughs> That's exactly so anything my surprised you when you after you stepped into this role coming from community care? You know what? It was fascinating to meet, to start to meet, and to now work with 
the clinical leaders from around the country. I mean, the directors of the program offices that directly report to me, but then a lot of the, the frontline professionals just who just have a level of excellence that is just unprecedented. I mean, case in point, the what we've needed to pull together, the expertise that we've needed to pull together around the pandemic. Um, there's there's just a, a great level of commitment from our clinicians from around the yes, country. Sure. Um, the the ability for this health system to use all of that expertise um, is, I think, been displayed during the pandemic, where we really pulled together and and responded uh, wonderfully. Um, I think in an in an unprecedented manner. So it it wasn't a surprise. I would say that I would expect that level of excellence, but it was reassuring to yeah. know that um, actually I'm just here to enable everyone yeah. around me. Right. You know, they're all doing the amazing work. I'm just here to maybe help direct it a little bit and coach it a little yeah. bit. Well, I think you hit it right. I think that's what we all in central office should be doing, yes. is to be able to facilitate. Exactly. You know, the, the things happen in the field where patients are being seen every single day. Um, you mentioned COVID. Yeah. Um, so we obviously can't skip over that. Um, anything in our COVID response that, uh, especially on the community care side, because we had such a change over the way we were providing care mm -hmm. for, for so many months during our COVID response, but there's anything that really stood out to you that we're doing from any, any front uh, that we're doing well and maybe we want to share that we're leading in the nation. Yeah, you know, I think our responsiveness um, to the pandemic as a whole, whether it be under clinical services or community care, is is what we need to celebrate. I mean, there were a lot of changes uh, throughout, really, healthcare as a whole because of the pandemic, right. right? CMS, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, issued a lot of rules that affect a lot of the private sector. VA, when possible, we try to mirror that, and we were able to make those changes almost immediately. Um, we we really, I, pivot is just the best word right. to describe what we've done right throughout VA. We pivoted to paying claims differently and at different rates. We uh, really assessed how we were paying the nursing homes, you know, both right. contracted as well as state veteran home. Um, we uh, immediately started pivoting so that we would allow more telehealth in the community with the community care providers because right. there's there's no reason to limit any services during these this you know public health yeah. time public health crisis so um, I was just very proud that the team we just came together and, and as soon as we heard I don't know something was happening differently right. or something needed to occur the team just pivoted and, and came together um, and it's been the same uh, as, as in clinical services um, while we've been developing, of course, the moving forward plan and right. the like. Um, yeah. There's just uh, all hands on deck sort of response and, yeah. and that's been refreshing. Who would have ever thought before the pandemic that you would use a word like ability to pivot, right. flexibility and agility by a large, very large organization like VA and VHA specifically on our right. healthcare front. Exactly. It, it, I, I hear these words often used about us and our response, yeah. and I can't agree more, but nobody would ever thought about a year ago yeah. using any of those terms around a large government organization yeah. like us. But yeah. it really has shows about the employees and um, and what they can do and how they can do it. So Hands it's down. amazing. Hands down. Um, our, our, I think so much of the focus, uh, and you know, separate from what might be going on in the private sector, so much of the focus is because of our mission, right? We, have, right. we know that we have to do the right thing right. in order to save lives, to prevent disease, uh, to treat um, veterans. And, and I think you know, our ability to really wipe away all of the distraction and put on those blinders right. to that solution, I, I think is, is what saved a lot of lives. We unfortunately haven't been able to save them right. all. This is a, a, a alarming disease that we still need to be combating every day, um, but we've had a response that's, again, been unprecedented. Yeah, well, thank goodness for our employees. Very done much an so. amazing Very job. Very much so. Um, you are involved in so many initiatives in VHA. <laughs> you're a superwoman, there's no doubt about it. Um, is there something, uh, any of those initiatives that you're specifically happy, proud of, or that you're enjoying the most working on? 
Without a doubt, um, I am loving the work that we've done over the last year uh, on diversity and inclusion. Um, we had the IPT uh, integrated project team uh, form to come up with recommendations. I think uh, the fact that uh, the you know, multiple discussions going on around the country about racial justice and, and other issues throughout this year uh, really uh, solidified the need for yeah. the work that we right. did in that group. The fact that it's now being um, institutionalized and we'll have a director of diversity and inclusion soon, I, I think is a critical piece. Um, I think, you know, the recognition, of course, that, uh, you know, VA is about equitable treatment of yeah all um, veterans and staff, we need to be looking at not only recruitment and retainment efforts uh, within our staff, but then also how perhaps diversity, inclusion, and equity impacts veterans and, and their right. health outcomes. Yep. Um, so we're, we're initiating some additional effort moving forward on looking at just those issues, yep. and I'm very proud to be a part of it. Yeah, it's fantastic, and I, I'm really excited about what that Office of Diversity, diversity and Inclusion can do yeah to help us to um, ensure that our workforce and our leaders yes. all look like our, our veterans that we serve every single day. And we there need we to really continue to focus a lot of energy on yeah. it. So yeah, I'm very proud of that as well. Excellent, yeah. yeah. You know, I think uh, going back to kind of the National Academy of Medicine, the reason why it's so important, they had one of the you know foundational reports uh, called Unequal Treatment that really did look at um, the impact of diversity of the healthcare workforce mm -hmm. on actual healthcare outcomes. There is a direct correlation. There is. There isn't just this feel good yeah. argument that yeah. we need to diversify for diversity's sake. It actually does impact veteran no, care. That's right. Um, and so, as much as yes, we need to assure that our environment for our staff, for, for every level of staff, um, is one that's accepting and right. inclusive, uh, it's also the right thing to yeah. do because we're a health system that's and because right. we treat. We treat veterans of, of all different creeds. Yeah, yeah, and and they all those veterans have said, "I will defend yes. this country." Every single one of them. So they they deserve it, and, exactly. and we owe it to them. Exactly. So uh, I think you're an amazing leader and executive in our organization. And if you and we talked about a little bit before about mentoring those, yeah. is there something that you look for, or something that that you could tell? somebody that's an aspiring leader that here's something that you might want to do or yeah. focus some energies on? I think it's a great question. Um, actually, in community care, I really uh, enjoyed working with um, who I would consider just up and coming leaders who over the years I was with the office really grew uh, right. into to new roles, new opportunities. And I think one of the pieces of advice that I gave one of them um, was to begin to think more strategically. A lot of times we get caught yeah. in um, our day to day and the in tasks, right? The, the letters that come to our office that we need to answer or the data report yeah. that we need to pull together, some PowerPoint that you need to, to have projected and, and its accuracy and the like. But um, I, I enjoy for leaders to instead to take that step back and to think strategically what am I doing today? How does it fit within the larger mission of VA, of, yeah. of our office here in community care and clinical services, um, to really think long term um, as opposed to just day to day? And, and part of that is, is really the fundamental piece of strategic thinking. But at the same time, we then also have to, especially in community care, we really needed to take on the ability to communicate with the field and to operationalize right. in in um, sufficient ways. So I, I often challenge people to be both strategic and operational at the same time. Uh, and that's hard, because a lot yeah. of our brains don't go in both directions, right. particularly at once. Um, but that's definitely something I look for and that I, I try to coach others in. Yeah, I, I think those are all great points. Um, we, and you had talked before about in mentoring and now mm -hmm. as well. Um, so what are some, uh, if somebody was to come to you and say, I am looking for other opportunities to, uh, to improve myself, to do something a little bit different, mm -hmm. I mean, how would you kind of guide them into these kind of things? I think, um, I, I think in VA there's a lot of opportunities because yes. like we were saying earlier, there's always a need for that additional yeah. input. Even if you feel you don't have a level of expertise, your input, being at the front line, being in a facility, being in a program office, 
you have an experience that is important and, and that um, can help guide us. So what I suggest is to volunteer, to speak up for committees, join IPTs, join councils, right. attend meetings so that you can provide that input so that you can see how others um, are running the meeting, you know, at a very mundane level all the way up to how we're developing strategy. Um, I, I think involvement is, is the biggest yep. piece of the advice um, so that you can see where you might fit in so that you can perhaps learn and so that, you know, you can perhaps um, excel in the particular task, but then also maybe escalate yourself a little bit to a new role. Yeah, and I think you, you hit on it, you know, create that strategic view, mm -hmm. broaden your horizons and see different things out there so that mm -hmm. you can understand a bigger picture. And then you then it creates opportunities as well. Exactly. And also gets your name out there about there people. You go. If I if I was to offer that advice, to someone, exactly. that's kind of what I would do. I mentioned before about your LinkedIn account and yeah. I and I truly enjoy following it and, and LinkedIn's really become quite the uh, social media thing to yeah. me. Um, mm -hmm. I don't I'm not on Facebook, I don't mm -hmm. do these kind of things. So so really understanding and seeing hearing about leaders and Thought, thought those fo folks that uh, really uh, d direct people into thinking a different way yeah. and those kind of things. Um, and so following that, you are belong to a whole bunch of groups. I don't know how you time time, time to sleep, actually. But, uh, you belong to a whole a bunch of different or outside organizations. Um, maybe you can describe a couple of them and then maybe how they affect you or what we do in VA. Sure. Um, so the one that I'm most proud of, I actually founded. Um, it's called the Tour for Diversity in Medicine. And uh, I started it ooh, uh, almost 10 years ago now uh, with one of my good friends. And we go around the country, we take a group of clinicians, physicians, dentists, pharmacists, We'll be adding optometrists soon, um, podiatrists, um, and we mentor students. We we run full day programs for underrepresented minority high school and college students. Wow. And we and we've been to 27 states. We've had more than 3,000 students in our program uh, since, of course, we've converted to virtual this year. Uh, we've had even more than that actually attend our virtual webinars just almost every week. Like tonight we're on Instagram doing an Instagram live for students and, and we just tell our stories and we mentor them and and more than anything motivate them right. because it's it's a marathon into medicine. Yeah. It's you know yeah. it's it's it, um, immediate gratification is is not an <laughs> option. Right. Uh, so you have to you know really understand what you're getting into. And uh, I do a lot of actually pretty much all my free time is with the, <laughs> we call it the tour. Um, we do a, a great amount of outreach and mentoring for students. That is fantastic. Again, yeah. you you continue to surprise me like every day. <laughs> uh, so how does somebody how does a high school student get involved in that if they want are interested in that? And yeah. are they is it something that goes through the STEMS class? or no it's it's basically social media based to get oh, okay. connected just follow us on we're wow. on everything Instagram Facebook Twitter and it's usually me doing all of that I'm flipping <laughs> on my phone between different accounts um, and we'll announce webinars we'll announce uh, our next tour is actually going to be based for Philadelphia schools in February wow. um, so we'll do three nights of programming for Philly students That's um, fantastic. yeah in a partnership with Temple, yeah. And, and maybe one day those students will become VA doctors. And there we go, <laughs> there be, we go. And, and I actually, I just was invited, I'm gonna be lecturing to some students at a policy class out in California about the VA and about working for the VA and okay. everything. So yes, I actually have another VA physician on the tour with me. She's a podiatrist out in Vegas. Um, and so we, we talk about our experience in That's VA great. all the time. That's fantastic, well like I said, you continue to surprise me, but I shouldn't be surprised. But <laughs> do amazing things. Well, we come to the end of our time. Thank you so much for taking the Thank time you. to be with us. And I hope everybody learned as much as I did. And I really appreciate all that you do, seriously, everything Thank that you. you do to touch people, not only in the VA, but outside of the VA. We are all just blessed to know you. And so thanks for being with us. Thank you so much for the time. Thanks. This is great. Great. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed today's conversation. A huge thank you to all of you for listening. Join us for our next episode where we get a chance to chat with Dr. Richard Stone, Executive in Charge of the Veterans Health Administration. See you next time.